from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 33, recorded on March 6, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack, called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. And today, we're going to take a closer look at Paul's last column, which is entitled, Was it a mistake to mandate COVID vaccines? So maybe we can start by having you take us back to 2020 and tell us how that first year the pandemic played out. Well, it was a nightmare. I mean, we had nothing. The first death from COVID, at least reported death, was the end of February of 2020. And then, you know, hundreds of people were dying a day, thousands of people were dying a day. Um, we didn't have antiviral agents until October. We didn't have monoclonal antibodies until November. And we didn't have vaccines until December. So we had nothing other than to try and limit human to human contact. So I would have imagined that when we finally did have vaccines, which was in December of 2020, they would have been seen for what they were, which is a godsend, which was true for many. Many people saw it that way, but some unfortunately didn't. So the vaccines became available at the end of 2020. And and you point out in your article some incredible numbers on the uptake. Right. Uh, and to the credit, well, first of all, to the credit of the Trump administration for Operation Warp Speed, I think within 11 months using a technology we'd never used before, messenger RNA, we had two very effective and safe vaccines and, and remain, frankly, remarkably safe. Not absolutely safe, but remarkably safe, considering it's a new technology. And then we had to do something also that we didn't have in place in this country, which is really set up an infrastructure for mass vaccinating adults, which we did a million people a day, two million people a day, three million people a day. By the time we were in the middle of 2021, roughly six, seven months into the availability of a vaccine, 70 percent of the U.S. population had been vaccinated. But then we hit a wall and 30 percent of the U.S. population simply refused to get a vaccine. So what to do? Why did they refuse to be vaccinated? Do we know? I think a couple of reasons. I think one, because they um, were frightened about the vaccine. I mean, it was our first genetic vaccine. It's a biological agent that you're injecting into your arm, which if you don't really understand the agent very well, you can see how people would be scared. I think people denied, some people denied the um, the impact of this virus, which is remarkable. Um, there were definitely a number of people who would be on social media or even in Congress who would say that we're making a bigger deal of this virus than it was. So I think those are probably the two big reasons. So then mandates were, were put in place. What were, what were they for? Well, first of all, you could argue we should have never needed mandates. I mean, in a better world, anybody who would have looked at the data associated with these vaccines would have lined up to get them. We really shouldn't have had to mandate vaccines. Mm -hmm. But... But we did. And I think probably the, the biggest reason at, at that time was our healthcare system was overwhelmed by this virus. I can tell you, and I work at a children's hospital, which was probably less impacted than adult hospitals. You know, we had three floors of COVID. We had trouble taking care of not only COVID patients, but the other patients we were responsible for. We canceled elective surgeries, as many hospitals did. And so it was a little galling, frankly, that, that people with a vaccine available chose not to get it yet we're perfectly willing to, to sort of overwhelm our emergency department or overwhelm our hospital. They were perfectly willing to avail themselves of medical care, but not the medical care that offered them vaccines. It was hard to watch, frankly. And so we had to flatten the curve. We had to flatten the curve. And the way we, we decided to do that was to mandate vaccines, that, you, that you, you had to get a vaccine to go to work, to go to school, to go to a bar, to go to a restaurant, to go to a place of worship, to go to a sporting event. Um, and that, um, I think, did impact to some extent vaccine uptake. I know, I remember there was one uh, couple or family that I saw initially on the floor and then ultimately in the intensive care unit. It was an older adolescent who had pretty significant respiratory disease, ultimately requiring an intensive care unit admission. And uh, he wasn't vaccinated, although he could have been, because this was, we were, you were able to get a vaccine. You were authorized a vaccine by uh, May of 2021 for anybody over 12. So he was old enough to have gotten a vaccine, didn't get it. 
Uh, his mother didn't get it. His siblings didn't get it. And I remember talking to the parents and the father did get vaccinated. And I asked him why. And he just casually said, well, I had to for work. So I think to some extent vaccines were used, but uh, I think I think there was value in mandating them for a lot of reasons. First of all, we know that if you got a vaccine and then you got COVID, you would shed less virus. Therefore, you would be you would be less transmissible, less capable of infecting someone else. And, and most importantly, you would decrease dramatically your chance of being hospitalized. So in 2021, you were 12 times more likely to be hospitalized if you weren't vaccinated. And in 2022, six times more likely to be vaccinated, to be hospitalized if you weren't vaccinated. So vaccination clearly was a value. It's a shame we had to mandate it. You would think we wouldn't have had to, but I think we did. I remember going to a theater here in New York and they checked my everybody's vaccine record at the door. You had it on a little app and you showed it to them to see that you were, otherwise you couldn't go to the theater. <laughs> It was really I know there's somebody like Kyrie Irving, right, who, who's, you know, a, a basketball star for the Brooklyn Nets at the time. And um, you, in order to en enter the stadium where Brooklyn played, you had to be vaccinated. Well, he refused to be vaccinated, so he couldn't play for their 41 home games and lost half his salary, which was, you know, $16 million. He was willing to lose $16 million because he refused to be vaccinated. <laughs> That's just crazy because, oh, well, we don't have to go through that. So... Uh, in your in your column, you write about how some people claimed they want to exercise their personal freedom and not be told to get vaccinated. Why doesn't that work? You went through this. What, tell tell us why it doesn't work. So so COVID is a contagious disease. If you choose not to be vaccinated, or said another way, you choose to increase your chance of getting infected and and uh, and transmitting that infection to someone else. You're making a choice for someone more than yourself. Um, tetanus, for example, is not a contagious disease. If you choose not to get a tetanus vaccine and you get tetanus, no one is going to catch it from you. But, but here, this is a contagious disease. And remember, there's about 9 million people in this country who cannot be successfully vaccinated because of the level of immunosuppression they're getting, because of their cancer therapies or because of their solid organ transplants or bone marrow transplants. Do you have any responsibility to them? Because when you get on an elevator or you get on a bus or whatever, it's possible you could be sitting next to someone who can't be vaccinated, do you have a responsibility to your neighbor? So the title of the article is, uh, Did We Make a Mistake? So why, why do you think we might have made a mistake in mandating the vaccines? I think we're seeing that now. I think what happened was there have been hundreds of pieces of legislation pushing back against sort of these tenets of public health, which includes not only masking, but vaccines. And as a consequence, vaccines, to some extent, became a dirty word. I think we leaned into this libertarian left hook, this notion of personal freedom, bodily autonomy, which was more province of the right during this, uh, this uh, pandemic. And as a consequence, you're seeing an erosion, in some, to some extent, in vaccine rates among kindergartens gardeners because their parents are choosing to exempt them from vaccines, either a philosophical exemption or a religious exemption. So you're seeing more than we have ever before uh, a, a use of non-medical exemption among kindergartners. And I think as a consequence of that, what you're seeing is measles, just what you would expect to see when you see an erosion in vaccine rates. So we now have roughly 15 states that have measles. And I, I just think Measles, it's at some level, um, it's not just that we've largely eliminated the disease, we've eliminated the memory of disease because measles can make you sick. And, you know, I'm of an age, obviously, where as a child of the 50s, I had measles at a time when there'd be three to four million cases of measles and there'd be 48,000 hospitalizations and 500 deaths from measles. Measles is a serious infection, an occasionally fatal infection. And I feel we're playing a very dangerous game right now. And also it's impacting school mandates in, in very, as you mentioned in Mississippi, uh, no more school mandates, right? Right. So, so you, well, there's always school mandates. I think what, what happens is there's now an increase in exemptions to okay. school mandates, so non-medical exemptions. So that's what happened in Mississippi. So there's a lawyer representing a group called Informed Consent Action Network, which is not a religious organization, quite the opposite. Um, and they, they are very proud of the fact that they've introduced a, uh, a uh, religious uh, exemption. And now uh, the, the hundreds and hundreds of children in Mississippi have chosen that exemption. And no doubt what will follow is an increase in susceptibility to measles and certainly likely an increase in cases of measles. So it's the freedom to do harm. So if um, we end up having a big measles outbreak, do you think that will impact 
these exemptions or it won't have any effect at all? Yes, I think it will. And, and the reason I say that is I lived through the 1991 measles epidemic in Philadelphia. So in a three month period, it, 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 between 1991 and 1992 in the winter, we had 1,400 cases of measles and nine deaths. It centered on two religious communities that chose not to vaccinate their children. Um, and as a consequence, they formed the epicenter of that outbreak. There were in those two groups, 600 cases and six deaths, but the virus spilled into the surrounding community, not surprisingly, causing an additional 900 cases and three deaths. Um, we got to the point in, 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 our, in our city where people were scared to come into the city. Um, the, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania gave us hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to vaccinate down to six months of age. And, and I think the most amazing aspect of that, I think for the first time in American history, and it's never happened since, is we had compulsory vaccination, not mandatory vaccination. Mandatory vaccination is you are asked to get a vaccine. If you don't, you may not be able to go to the school you want to go to or go to work. Compulsory vaccination is you are vaccinated whether you want to be or not. And so here you had parents that did not want their children vaccinated, but by, by a city law, they had to be vaccinated. And so what happened was one of the uh, pastors of the churches, Charles Reinert, sort of so sought out the American Civil Liberties Union because what they were doing was perfectly legal. We had a religious exemption to vaccination in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. What they were doing was legal. So he sought out the ACO to represent do, doing what they were doing, not vaccinating on religious grounds, which was legal. And the ACLU, a group that is perfectly willing to represent unpopular causes like Nazis marching down the streets of Skokie, Illinois, refused to take that case because what they said was, while you, we recognize a religious freedom here, you are not at right, you do not have a religious right to martyr your children. And you had to be there at the time. People were so scared of measles at that time. I, it's hard to know, to imagine in retrospect that something like that ever happened, but that's what happened in Philadelphia in 1990, in 1991, 1992. I, I, I will say this, what, what stopped that outbreak for all our vaccination, for all our education, there was one thing that stopped that outbreak, mm. spring. It is a winter disease. Spring stopped that outbreak. Mm. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> I wonder... That was the 90s. I think a lot has changed since then, and I'm not sure the ACLU would have the same position, but we'll see. So after all this, Paul, uh, if you had to do it again, would you say we shouldn't mandate COVID vaccines? Um, I, I, I think we were right to do that. Um, our health system was so overwhelmed with that virus. We couldn't take care of, of COVID patients or other patients. We couldn't do everything we needed to do. We shouldn't have had to have mandated vaccines, but I do think at the time it was the right thing to do. I would have never predicted that this would have been the outcome, i.e. measles among children was the outcome of that. And, and it may be worse. I, I, we'll see what happens. It's already March. So I think as we move into spring, we'll see measles abate. But I do worry about what happens next year with this erosion in, in school mandates. Because a number of countries did not mandate vaccination, right? And they did well. Is that because they're just smaller than we are? Or because they actually respect sort of public health institutions. I mean, the Scandinavian countries never mandated vaccines, but had very high immunization rates. They actually trust their public health agencies. I know yeah. it's hard to believe that anyone does <laughs> that, but, but they did. <laughs> One last thing, Paul, you quote Lawrence Gostin saying, we are going to have a worse pandemic and this can be a problem. I, I would say we don't know that we're going to have a worse pandemic, but it doesn't have to be worse. It could be just the same as COVID. And uh, if we go through the same thing, um, it, it'll be problematic. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I, I do think um, there are, are certain weapons we have in public health, uh, vaccination, isolation, quarantine. And I feel like the legislative pushback that's occurred associated with this pandemic may make public health weaker in the future. We'll see. We'll put a link to this column in the show notes. You can go and read it all yourself. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. 